Malaysian 370, contact with Jimin 120, decimal 9. Okay, I am calling on all of my guides of the highest good. Magdalene, Yeshua, Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, all y'all. I'm calling all y'all in to, to protect this recording, um, to help me say and help Mr. Fox say what needs to be said, what needs to be heard and understood by the collective with this crazy mystery and I am asking that any beings that are here for nefarious purposes that wish to infiltrate my channel, infiltrate my message, I do not consent. And I revoke any permission that you think you have to use my wounds as entry points. And I ask that all those nefarious beings be escorted out at this moment. And so be it. All right, you guys, today we are actually going to be talking about the disappearance of Malaysia Flight 370. But before we get into the story, I do want to take a moment. I usually do this in, in the introduction, but the template of this channel is changing a little bit since I now have a sponsorship. I do want to take a moment to give a huge, 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 massive Thank you to all of my patrons and my producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. You guys are the original sponsors. You're the OGs. And my heart will always belong with you guys because you guys supported me and you helped this channel stay up and running. And for that, I am in eternally grateful. If you would like to become a Patreon or a producer of Esoteric Atlanta, the link, as always, is in the description box below. All right, you guys, so let's talk about Malaysia Flight 370 and its mysterious disappearance. Now, you might recognize that I'm, I'm again, I'm doing this mystery different than the way I normally do deep dives into mysteries. And that is because we are going to actually get some answers. We are going to get some answers from the Cassiopeians through Mr. Fox. But before we bring Mr. Fox in on the screen, I am going to give you a little bit of background information so that we know where we're coming from. We know what the narrative is. We know what happened, all that we really know what happened. And then, of course, what the, the the overlords, the controllers want us to believe happened, which will then come into play with, with what Mr. Fox has to share with us from the Cassiopeians, if that makes sense. Malaysia Flight 370 was an international flight that was flying from Kuala Lumpur International Airport to Beijing Capital International Airport on the 8th of March 2014. Now, I do remember when this plane disappeared, um, but 2014 for me was a really big year. I had a lot going on in my life at this time, so I remember seeing this story on the news, and of course... Anytime a plane goes down, anytime there's something wrong with any type of aviation, of course, that's terrifying. And my heart absolutely goes out to all the uh, families of the missing uh, passengers and crew members of this flight. And before we go any further, I, I, I want to focus on that for a minute because I want to I want to say that even though we are going to look at what the Cassiopeians have to say about this flight, I, I, I really want to extend that humanity out to everybody who was affected by this tragedy. Um, I can't imagine what that would be like to lose a loved one like that. Um, we know that death is inevitable. 
although as you'll see these passengers might not actually be dead but we know that that the idea of us eventually dying is inevitable but i don't think anybody ever plans on their husband their wife their children their parents their friends to to go in such a horrific way and the fact that these families of these victims don't have any conclusive answers at this point they're still massively an open wound in them now i i'm very um I'm someone that doesn't necessarily believe that in any situation there really absolutely needs to be closure. The closure should come from within your own healing. But in this situation, I just I just can't imagine. I can't imagine if my husband took a just a routine flight. And the next thing I can imagine that hearing that that plane not only has disappeared, but nobody knows where it is. Like there's no crash site. There's no no one really knows what happened. I cannot imagine the pain that I would be feeling. There is a three-part documentary on Malaysia Flight 370 now on Netflix, and you do get to hear from some of the victims' loved ones. And it's interesting because a lot of these victims' loved ones do actually call bullshit on the narrative that they're fed by the controllers, which is really, really fascinating, which again, we'll get more into with Mr. Fox later on. So let's, what do we know? What do we actually know? Let's start there. We always got to start with what we know. So again, this was a red eye. This was happening on March 8th of 2014. It was going from Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur to Beijing. This is only like a five hour flight. So it's not that long of a flight. I've taken many, many a red eyes in my life basically it's the same it would be and i used to do this red eye a lot it would be like flying from los angeles to atlanta like it's a there are like 14 different flights that go back and forth between los angeles and atlanta every single day it's the same thing between kuala lumpur and beijing yes they're different countries but it's it's a very very routine type of travel this flight carried 227 passengers and 12 crew members at 12.41 a.m., the plane took off. Again, at this point, everything was completely normal, very, very routine. There was nothing out of the ordinary with the airplane or with any of the pilots or with any of the passengers. The plane started to travel the route, the normal route to Beijing, which means that the plane was going to have to fly over the South China Sea. Now, everybody knows that we have these things called air traffic controllers, and the pilot's job is to kind of keep in contact with these air traffic controllers as these planes travel throughout the world, right? This is for many different reasons. It's for air traffic because there's lots of airplanes. Heaven forbid we don't want a head-on collision with another airplane or a, you know, like a like a, a fender bender with another airplane in the sky. And so the air traffic controllers keep the planes kind of in their in their lane, heading to their destination. They're also looking out for any type of emergency situation where the plane might have to make an emergency landing, whatever the case may be. But when people are in an airplane, the pilot is always in contact with some form of air traffic control. Now, as this plane started to head over the South China Sea, eventually it's going to cross the territory of Malaysia into the next territory. At this point, it's going to change over from the air traffic controllers in Malaysia to the Chinese air traffic controllers. At about 1.19 a.m., the Malaysia Flight 370 started to leave the Malaysian district. And it entered into this kind of waypoint area as it was transitioning again over to the Chinese air traffic controllers. The only problem is the Ho Chi Minh ATC never even got a chance to make contact with Malaysia Flight 370. And the last thing we ever heard from the pilot of Malaysia Flight 370 goes as follows. Malaysia 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120, now, I just have to say, God bless the air traffic controller who was the one to say goodnight, Malaysia Flight 370. Like, legit, you were the last person to speak to this airplane. Because soon after that goodnight was exchanged, the airplane simply disappeared. Now, as far as factual information, that's all we have. 
that's literally all we have. But what would ensue after this plane disappeared would become a circus that was almost like a global Where's Waldo. Now, of course, again, the Malaysia officials who were in charge of this airplane, this air vehicle, were panicked. I can't, I mean, to give them the benefit of the doubt, I, I cannot imagine how they were feeling when one of their planes literally just vanished. Like, there is no, no sign of it crashing anywhere. It just completely, poof, it was gone. And then to also be the family of the victims to get to Beijing, because from what I understand, there was a moment in time where the air traffic controllers and Malaysian Airlines thought for maybe a second it was like their system that was glitching and maybe the flight was perfectly fine and they were panicked for nothing. But by the time the plane was due to arrive in Beijing, nothing happened. They started to pull the families of the victims into private rooms. And you can see many, many videos of this, of people just screaming and howling and crying. And I personally, like, God, I cannot imagine. There was this French dude that's being interviewed in the Netflix series. And he literally lost his wife and two of his children that were on this flight. They were flying from Malaysia to China for, like, one of their breaks, and he was, like, super excited to see his kids and, obviously, his wife, and boom, like, they're just gone, and I can't even imagine to be a parent and to, of course, the first thing we think when a plane disappears, the first thing we're naturally going to think is it crashed, and as I've always said, death is not something that I fear. I don't actually fear death, but I do fear how I'm going to die, and I think crashing in an airplane would be one of the most horrific ways to go and to believe that your children went through this fear i can't imagine like i just simply cannot imagine well as time went on there were literally no traces no evidence of any type of debris for a little while they could find nothing and of course people wanted answers where the hell did this plane go? And so the powers that be decided that the perfect scapegoat for this disappearance was the pilot. Now, according to the Cassiopeians, which we will talk about in a moment, this is not what happened to Malaysia Flight 370. So I want to make that very, very clear. And we're going to talk about why the controllers came up with this story with Mr. Fox. But I do feel like it's important to share this. This is a legitimate conspiracy theory. It's not. It's junk conspiracy. This is not what happened. But we're, I'm going to go ahead and tell you anyway, because this is the narrative. This is what they try to sell the people. Now, of course, if you watch the documentary series, most of the victim's family are like, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And even when one of the people started to find debris from the plane people were finding it very suspicious and we'll we will get into it so the story came became that the pilot was basically on a suicide mission and that once he left the air traffic boundary of malaysia in that waypoint heading into Cho ho chi minh air traffic control he decided at that point since he was not being monitored for this like couple of minutes that he would pull the plane and go the exact opposite direction towards the Indian Ocean. They say that a military radar picked up the plane making this sharp left turn, but like really, we're, we're gonna trust, we're gonna trust the powers that be telling us that a military radar picked it up. Listen, we're not that stupid. So they concocted this story that basically the pilot decided that he was going to make this drastic turn. And he was basically just going to fly the plane until the plane ran out of gas and then he was going to nosedive it into the Indian Ocean. If I was going to end my life, myself, I'm not going to, but if I were to, that would be the last thing I would do. I don't know anybody in their right mind who would decide to end their life in that way, taking all those other people with them. So after they kind of came up with this story, they had all these people out from Australia, from all different countries in the area, searching the Indian Ocean. Now, the Indian Ocean is a huge territory. And so trying to find a plane in the Indian Ocean I mean, that's literally like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Like, I mean, 
but but nonetheless you know good people went out they did really try to find what they could to give some type of closure to the victim's family well all of a sudden these plane parts started to show up on the shores of madagascar of the shores of mozambique all these places in africa on the east coast of africa and there was one guy in particular that kept finding these pieces which is crazy to me i'm not, I'm not even going to say his name because i don't even want to bring legitimacy to this story if you want to watch the netflix series you can but literally this guy was like i'm gonna go to africa and i'm gonna find the, this debris because if this plane crashed in the indian ocean then all this debris is going to wash up on the shores of africa so i'm gonna go there and i'm gonna find it and he gets to Africa and he literally is finding piece after piece after piece after piece. It is it is like playing hide and go seek with a bunch of four year olds, right? Like when you play with a bunch of four year olds and they literally close their eyes and like they can't see me, they can't see me. Like this is so obviously a setup. I've grown up on beaches. My mom's family is from the coast of South Carolina. I spent half of my childhood running up and down the coastline not once from my recollection was there ever any debris from an airplane that i could see wash up on the shores yes we found jewelry we found toys sometimes all sorts of shells but like to find i can understand maybe finding one one thing from the airplane that um you stumbled upon but to find as many pieces as this guy did is like i i'm like oh my god are people actually believing this but yes people started to believe it i mean i know we're a gangster planet i know we're like one of the most hardest planets to live on but are we also one of the most stupidest planets to live on because you don't have to be a rocket science to understand that this was completely far-fetched and not only that but a lot of, again a lot of the victims families were like this is not you can't prove to me that this is debris from Malaysia Flight 370. And the big kicker was that the little black box that all airplanes have, it has still yet to be found. If we could find the black box from Malaysia Flight 370, then we will have our answers. But according to the Cassiopeians, that's not going to be possible. Because according to the Cassiopeians, not only are the victims of Malaysia Flight 370 still alive? But they're still up in the air in that airplane. And for them, nothing has happened. For them, no time at all has passed. For them, they're still on that red eye. But to get into what all that means with Mr. Fox and the Cassiopeians, you're going to have to follow the link down in the description box below to our rumble page because the explosive information that mr fox has to share would never be allowed on this platform so with that being said i'll see you over on rumble